Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference with Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie is going to be talking about modern monetary theory, MMT, and how it can be used to tackle austerity. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi, thank you. Hi, Walton. So, um, just to give us some, maybe give us some background about yourself. Uh, you're in, you're in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, you're at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Is that right? That's right. And yep, I've been there for um, well since 1999 with some other scholars that work in the same area that I work in. Yep. Okay. And uh, you are a leading proponent of MMT. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, MMT is really a, a framework for analysis. It's a, an emerging, I guess you would say, branch of macroeconomics. It's an approach that um, brings together insights from a number of economists who are probably familiar to many in the institutionalist or post-Keynesian, uh, maybe even the Marxian strand, um, people like Hyman Minsky, Wynn Godley, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, Ava Lerner, um, and, a, and a number of others. But we sort of just take the what we perceive as the most important insights from a number of economists and we sort of build and layer those insights and what comes out of it is an approach that's been called not so much by us uh, initially but by others as modern monetary theory. Okay. Um, I am not an economist. I don't know whether uh, listeners are economists. So I've read up a bit about it and it's very, very interesting and my understanding is it's about how the state can control money supply. Uh, is, that, is that correct? Uh, because currently my understanding of the way new money is created, it's, it's by banks issuing debt and I think you're suggesting that uh, the state can, can create money. Is that true? Well, it's, it's both. It's, to be sure, it's both. Banks definitely create money. Uh, they create a different kind of money. Uh, but the state certainly creates the currency as well. And so what MMT does is try to focus people's attention on um, the power of the state to create money, the fact that money in the modern era is not inherently limited, that it is um, a, a fiat currency, right? It's, it's created by fiat. Modern governments create money um, by spending it into existence. And so they don't have to go out and, and get the currency, get money from someone who has it in order to spend, because in the modern era, governments can create currency simply by spending it into existence. Mm -hmm. We're not on a gold standard anymore. We don't have the types of monetary systems that are described in most of the textbooks, and yet we behave as if our policy choices are constrained by those old monetary systems that may have existed in the past where countries adopted gold standards and then faced constraints as a consequence in terms of how much money they could safely spend. We don't have those money anymore and it opens up a whole range of possibilities that weren't available under the old system. And I think that policymakers, most economists just haven't fully recognized the um, significance of going off of the gold standard and moving to a pure fiat money system. And because they don't recognize the significance, they fail to take advantage of the possibilities, the policy space mm -hmm. that's available under the current monetary system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I take it you're not a fan of uh, attempting to beat a recession through austerity? Well, I mean, look, the, the economy is driven by spending. Spending creates sales and sales create jobs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's, it's exceedingly frustrating when people talk about um, adopting austerity as some sort of a strategy for achieving economic growth. I mean, some countries don't have the policy space that a country like the U.S. or the U.K. or Canada or Japan has in the sense that we have these modern monetary systems that give us additional degree of freedom to work with. Countries in the Eurozone, for example, because they've given up their independent countries, they've limited the policy space that's available to them. Um, and so it, it really does make a huge difference in terms of getting the policy right to get the growth and the employment that ultimately 
Okay. I'm just going to uh, mute a couple of um, microphones there. Uh, that's just because um, it, it creates a bit of background noise. Um, just to say to everyone who's joined us in the past few minutes, um, thank you for, for joining us and um, you're welcome aboard. If you want to ask a question, you can either type it into the box, um, the chat, the chat box, um, or you can click the hand icon, and then you can speak the question. And I'll unmute your mic. I've just muted the mics now because there, there was a little bit of background noise. Um, and also, um, camera is optional, but if you'd like to start your video camera so that we can all see your glorious faces, there is a camera icon in the top left window. Uh, so you click that and. Uh, you will see yourself and then you push the play button at the bottom of the video window and um, you'll be able to share the video with with, any, with, with everyone else. Um, so welcome and um, please ask questions. Um, so Stephanie, I guess that means that Europe is in trouble in terms of being limited in what it can do. Uh, the UK controls its own currency and it has a bit more space as you were saying. What do you think what options do you think are available for Europe? What, what what kind of situation do the Eurozone countries find themselves in? And, and yeah, what can they do? Well, it's a dire situation, obviously. I mean, you know, people are suffering tremendously. And um, the options that are available to the individual governments to help recover their economies is, is very, very limited, right? And um, the reason that it's limited is that when the economy turns down, it turns down because people spend less. Mm -hmm. And less spending means fewer goods and services sold, and businesses need fewer workers, and so they lay people off, and you end up with this downward spiral. If there was someone who was able to spend in the opposite direction, when the private sector starts spending less, you typically expect your public sector to come in and fill in that gap, right? Provide the demand for the goods and services that help stabilize, put a floor under how far incomes are allowed to fall and how high unemployment is allowed to go. The problem is that all of these 17 countries that adopted the euro are in a position where they can only spend if they can get the euro. Mm -hmm. So where do they get the euro? They either raise euros by collecting taxes or they borrow the euro. Well, when the economy goes into the toilet, income falls and your tax receipts fall off. So what does that leave you with? It leaves you with, if you want to increase your public sector spending, you've got to borrow in order to do it. The problem in the Eurozone is that financial markets have recognized now that governments that don't create their own currency, that those that are users of the currency rather than issuers of the currency, might actually not be able to get the euros that they need in order to pay the debt when the time comes. And in order to compensate them for that risk of lending to a currency user, they want higher and higher rates of interest. The more worried they get about the size of the deficit and the size of the debt, the higher the premium that they require. And this makes it very difficult for a government to go out into the bond markets and borrow the money that, that's needed in order to allow the governments to step in and provide the fiscal spending, provide the stability, to put the floor under incomes and prevent the downward spiral. And so your question is, what can they do? Well, there's, there's not an awful lot they can do. And clearly, I think what they're trying to do isn't working. What they're trying to do is suppress wages, lay off workers, uh, renege on their commitments in terms of pensions and other social safety programs, increase cut incomes to the very people who typically drive the economic engine, right? The consumer accounts for between two-thirds and 70% of total spending in the economy, most developed economies. So you don't want to pull the rug out from under the people who drive the economic bus. And that's exactly what these austerity policies are doing in so many places across the Eurozone and, and elsewhere as well. So what you've got to do ultimately is get Euros into the hands of the public sector or somehow into the hands of the private sector to allow them to have the capacity to spend because spending drives economic activity. So where does the Euro come from? Well, at the end the day, the person with the license to create the euro is the ECB. So if full is to keep the eurozone intact and to keep it functioning, 
you've got to have the ECB violate its own rules and provide the euros in some fashion to the governments that then can step in and spend the euro as necessary. You could create an employment stabilization fund. You could set up a job guarantee program where the ECB says we're going to fund on a permanent basis, allocate euros on a per capita basis across every country in the eurozone. We recognize that no matter what you do in terms of your uh, attempt to be fiscally responsible, things are always going to happen. Market economies fluctuate. Capitalist economies are dynamic. They go through cycles, booms and busts. They're inevitable. We recognize that, and in order to allow you to cope with those inevitable business cycles, we're going to establish a fund that you can use when the downturn inevitably comes and help you stabilize your economy. That's one option. The other option, of course, is that you scrap the entire project. Everybody recovers their independence through re regaining a sovereign currency, and they run their policy in a much more responsible, in fact, fiscally responsible way. Thank you. Uh, that's very interesting. And um, a question from Peter Waterman, which is a good one, I think, is um, what is the relationship between MMT and Keynesianism? Well, I think we have to be maybe a little bit what we mean by Keynesianism, because, of course, there are different versions, different varieties of, of Keynesian economics. There are the post-Keynesians who are much closer uh, to the spirit of the general theory and following uh, the writings of John Maynard Keynes. And then there are Keynesians that I would put in quotation marks, um, those that work in the more mainstream tradition, the, the Hicks ISLM framework, those of your listeners that know some economics know what I'm talking about. Um, but this is what Joan Robinson, who's probably the most famous female economist of all time, these are the folks that she referred to as the bastard Keynesians. So they're really not terribly Keynesian. Um, but if we're talking about the post-Keynesians, then MMT is very close. I mean, people like Abba Lerner. Abba Lerner was a contemporary of Keynes's. And Lerner's uh, work that we appreciate, I think, the most is his work in the area of functional finance. And what Lerner explained is that governments that have control of their own currency and they don't pledge to convert that currency into something else, not into gold or silver, not into another country's currency. It's a floating exchange rate. It's a fiat currency. Governments that have that type of a monetary system have this policy space available to them that governments under different monetary systems don't have. And so what Lerner proposed, and Keynes and Lerner communicated with one another, and when Keynes read Lerner's work on fungal finance, he wrote to him and said, I am going to go and I'm going to push personal finance. I'm going to attempt to get people on my side of the pond interested in what it is you're proposing here. So what Lerner wanted was a very simple thing. He said, if you are able to create the currency in, in an unconstrained fashion, because the currency comes from you, you're the issuer, then you can never cry poor, you can never claim to be broke, you can never run out of money, you can never become insolvent, you never have to ask your population to share in some sacrifice and throw your hands up and say, I'd love to help, but there's just no money to do it. Okay? It removes that excuse completely from the government. Of course there's the money to do it. The question is, are there the real resources to do it? And if you have, as we have in the U.S., 25 million Americans who are unemployed, looking for full-time work, either underemployed or unemployed. They want to work, and they want to work for the dollar. That's what unemployment means, right? De facto, you have people who want a job that pays dollars and they can't get it. Then you have a government who issues the dollar. Well, it's irresponsible in learners' view. It is not sound policy to deny them the opportunity to gain employment, producing something useful in exchange for the dollar. So um, there's a lot of overlap. Even people like Hyman Minsky and Wim Godley, all, a lot of the people that we draw on heavily to develop the framework that's become known as MMT were also post-Keynesians of one type or another. Um, that's really insightful and that really helps. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I'm trying to understand a lot of what you're saying in, in layman's terms. And I guess the way I would put it is um, 
you have people who want to work, there are things that need to be done, the only thing missing from the equation is money. And why have an artificial constraint on the money supply when you don't need it? Uh, is that fair enough for a, for a totally dumbed down assessment? That's a, much nicer, that's a much nicer, simpler way to say what I, I think I more clumsily said. Yeah. Uh, what we're trying to do at Union Solidarity International is essentially challenge this idea that there is no alternative because this is the thing that's coming out of the mainstream media and the mainstream economists. Everyone is saying there is no alternative. This is the only way things that can be things can be done. What we'd like to do is make people aware that there are alternatives. There are plenty of rational ideas that people have that could turn the world economy around and actually change things quite dramatically uh, for the, for the better. So it really helps us. Um, to hear this and to know that there is, um, you know, big bodies of evidence and bodies of work which which demonstrate this. One of the the things which um, I saw recently was a, an article by James uh, Galbraith saying mm -hmm. that his answer to the recession um, was raise the min minimum wage dramatically. And you know, I can I can also imagine how that would be congruent with your own ideas, um, particularly because people at the bottom of the, the, the pay scales tend to spend all of their money back into the economy. They're not, uh, you know, investing and saving and all that kind of thing. So the more money, um, the more money that, that stays in the productive economy, the better for all of us. And uh, the current situation seems to be that surplus capital is getting sucked up into the financialized stratosphere and uh, it's not doing anything. It's, it's uh, you know, there's an investment strike, uh, there's, there's um, not enough money in the productive economy and uh, this idea of just getting the money out there. Um, in fact, uh, one of the commentators in the UK was speaking about quantitative easing and said that it would probably be more effective if they printed banknotes and uh, took them up in helicopters and just chucked them out over the over the city to to uh, give people to money to spend because the situation was they're giving money to the banks which they're not doing anything with. Right. Yeah, this is um, comes from Milton Friedman, actually, the idea of the helicopter drop. Okay. I mean, we're actually hearing quite a bit about it over here as well. People are saying, you know, the Fed needs to do more. The Fed needs to do more, even if it's time to start flying the helicopters and all of that kind of thing. Well, actually, the Fed isn't allowed. Most central banks, I imagine, wouldn't be permitted to do just that. The central banks are there, uh, when they make a purchase, they're supposed to buy financial and it just becomes an asset swap. The kind of helicopter drop that you're describing is really a fiscal policy. It's okay. a fiscal stimulus. And it's more akin to what uh, folks in the U.S. would remember happening uh, during the Bush administration, George W. Bush, when there was an economic downturn in the early part of the 2000s. And they said, oh, my God, you know, the private sector is retrenching. The private sector is trying to pay down their debt. They want to spend less. That's going to slow the economy. It is slowing the economy. We need to do something to counter that. So we're going to put checks in the mail, and we're going to send every U.S. taxpayer a $300 check for a single person, a $600 check for a married couple. And so one day you went to the mailbox, and you opened it up, and there was your stimulus check. Okay, that's akin to flying the helicopter, only, you know, instead of Not dropping it in the middle of the, in the, middle of the farm, uh, you, you actually just deliver it straight to the mailbox. So, yeah, that's, that's something that's been done before. But the problem is, as it was then, that high debt levels in the private sector were really the underlying problem. And so the private sector had taken on so much debt and was attempting to pay down that debt that when those checks arrive in the mail, a, a very high percentage of people who receive those checks use the check to pay down existing debt, which of course doesn't add anything to aggregate demand. It doesn't it doesn't cause anybody's cash register to ring. It doesn't make, you know, business sector any better, but it makes the consumer feel better because they're getting their debt level down. So if we were to do something like that today, it's helpful because you want the private sector to deleverage. You you need to help them pay down the debt because until they get their debt back down to a level where they're comfortable again, where relative to their income, they don't feel like they're struggling to make every payment, they're not going to go out and borrow and spend on new merchandise. So they've got to be permitted to deleverage. They need to be able to get the debt down. 
certain people aren't struggling with high debt levels. Those people, if they got a check, would go out and spend it. And that's where you get the stimulus. That's where the benefit to the economy comes from. It's not a very solution, flying the helicopters. I think we can do better than that. But uh, it, it would have some positive benefit, to be sure. Thank you. Uh, there's a question which has been typed into the chat box by Paolo, who's asking um, the estimate of GDP loss due to Italian unemployment from 1990 to 1999 is something like um, 4,700 billion euros. Is this plausible according to US data, similar data in the US? Yeah, unfortunately, things are bad enough that it probably is plausible. And I can tell you that right now, uh, there's an economist in Australia who's put together some estimates for um, the U.S. economy, just focusing on the difference between the path that the U.S. economy was on before the financial crisis. Let me see if you can see my hand. Mm -hmm. Here's the yes. path, right? Yes. We were on this trajectory. Yeah. But because of the financial crisis, we ended up down here. And so the difference between the two, the gap, is what we're giving up by not recovering our economy. It's all of the output, the income that's lost as a consequence of staying below the level that we would have been producing at had we not experienced the crisis and the ensuing economic downturn. And his name's Bill Mitchell, and uh, he has a very nice blog called Billy Blog, and he does tremendous work over in Australia, and he's estimated that in the U.S., right now, as a consequence of not recovering the economy to the previous level, that we're sacrificing the equivalent of $9.8 billion every day. Wow. So, you know, it's nearly $10 billion. It's like leaving money on the table and, and just walking away. And, and it's so inefficient and it's so socially destructive, um, never mind just the pure economics of it, you know, the social consequences of um, having high levels of unemployment in terms of health issues, suicide, divorce rates, and all the accompanying um, social ills that go along with that. It's just, a, it's just a tragedy. Thank you. There's a question from Sean. Um, I'm interested in MMT policy suggestions in preventing asset bubbles. Okay, so uh, on the New Economic Perspectives blog, we have someone who writes for us, and his name is uh, William K. Black, or Bill Black, and Bill Black's a former financial regulator. And uh, I think, you know, in terms of just the narrow MMT work that's been done, there's not a whole lot on preventing asset price bubbles, but if you bring in the regular things, which is why we have Bill Black um, blogging for us and working closely with us, then I think you get much closer because what, what you had in the case of the um, housing bubble in the U.S. anyway was Bill, Bill would say the three D's were at work. Desupervision, deregulation, and the decriminalization of you know fraud in the financial industry. And so until you address those sorts of issues, um, that help to hyperinflate bubbles like the one that, that we had in the housing sector here, you're not going to do much to stop asset price inflation. So that really has to come from the regulatory side. Okay. Um, Stephanie, are we going to see a Kansas City school to replace the Chicago School Economics, which has caused so <laughs> much damage in the world? We're, we're sure trying. You know, I mean... I think that after 15 years of developing this line of inquiry and this, uh, we've never been more optimistic than, than we have been this year. Uh, our work was finally featured in some pretty mainstream places, which is, you know, the worst thing you can be is ignored. Yeah. And we were ignored for so long by the mainstream. And now, finally, uh, at the beginning of the year, The Economist magazine ran a piece where they dealt at length with MMT as an alternative school of thought. Uh, um, the Financial Times has written about our work. The Washington Post, a very large feature story on us. And then, um, somewhat oddly, last month, they went up a five-page spread on Bill Black and UMKC's economics department and MMT and so forth. So from Everything from the Financial Times to Playboy magazine is, is now 
starting to look very carefully at heterodox economics approaches because the mainstream has failed so colossally, both in terms of predicting the crisis and in essentially every policy proposal that they put forward. Just they just have they've got essentially nothing to offer. So people for the first time in a long time are beginning to look outside of the narrow confines of the Chicago schools and and the Princetons. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And we, we've said to people that they can ask questions on Twitter as well. And um, and uh, someone, yeah, a question just come in from Alex Little on Twitter saying, um, people say printing money equals uh, Zimbabwe and or currency collapse. What's your response to that? Well, this is something that uh, we've dealt with many, many times because MMTers, the, the developers of this approach, we don't use the term printing money. It's really an outmoded gold standard phrase. We just say modern governments create money using keystrokes. They spend money into existence and they do it, you know, something that looks like this. And this is something that Ben Bernanke has been really clear about when uh, he was asked in an interview, is that taxpayer money you're spending? And Ben Bernanke says, it's not, ta it's not taxpayer money. He says, when the government wants to spend, we just use a keyboard and we mark up the size of the recipient's bank account. That's how we spend. When you pay your taxes, the numbers in your account go down, and they go down because of electronic transfers of funds back and forth. So we don't, first of all, we don't use the term printing money, but we know what we mean, right? Creating fiat currency, spending money into existence. And many, many people will hear that and say, wait a minute, if modern governments can create money, as Alan Greenspan said, in his words, without limit, and you're saying the government should keep the economy operating at full employment, well, that's a prescription for hyperinflation and we're going to end up like Zimbabwe or something. Not at all. Okay, not at all, and we've explained this over and over and over because it does come up so frequently. So if you were to search MMT, um, Billy blog, or, you know, the New Economic Perspectives blog, and hyperinflation, you'd have nice, lengthy statements about this, but I'll give you just a short one. What happened in Zimbabwe was not simply that you had a government that ran the so-called printing press, presses and spent too much money but that you had supply problems that constrained the available amount of goods and services relative to demand and that hyperinflated prices. And so what, what happened in Zimbabwe, of course, is that Mugabe comes along and redistributes the, the land. And it's largely farming land that we're talking about. And so the land is taken from the white farmers and transferred to the uh, African black population who are then who then find themselves in a position where they've got all this fertile farmland but they have no idea how to farm it because they weren't that's not what they did and as a consequence the supply of food stuff went significantly down and demand didn't change but the supply fell off and so you had a real problem in terms of uh, prices because the price of food just got bit up and up and up and up and the demand wasn't there because uh, they simply didn't know how to farm the land properly. So there were a lot of things going on, and, and it's, the, the Zimbabwe case is not a case of government simply spending too much money trying to achieve full employment. MMT is very careful, and Abilurna was very careful as well. The goal is to ensure that people who want to work have an opportunity to be employed doing something necessary, useful, productive in the economy. And if the government can, because of its power to suspend money into existence, ensure that the economy is, is running at full employment, that's responsible. To run your economy beyond full employment would be irresponsible and would threaten to set off inflation. And so it becomes this question of using your power to tax and spend in a way that achieves full employment, doesn't push your economy to run too fast where you get inflation, but also doesn't allow the economy to run too slowly where you get unemployment. So sometimes um, the MMT group will say fiscal policy should be like a thermostat in your home. If you have central air conditioning or heating or so you get too cold, you dial up the heat a bit. 
when you get too hot, you dial down and heat a bit. If your economy is overheating, it's time to raise taxes or cut government spending. If the economy is not warm enough, it's time to cut taxes or increase government spending. That's responsible fiscal policy. Hmm. Uh, first year comment which came in from Be Benedict is um, Zimbabwe borrowed heavily outside its own currency, um, which was part of the, part of the issue there. And um, a question again from Paolo, fiscal compact and Europact treaties force Eurozone nations to measure competitiveness only on the basis of wage, wage deflation. Some employers welcome this. How does MMT respond? Well, I mean, this is a this is a, a tragedy in motion. Watching the European countries engage in a in a race to the bottom, you know, where everybody is is chasing the guy just slightly in front of them with these wage cuts and reforms and all, you know, as we talked about earlier. Um, it's just, it's the race to Bangladesh is what it is. And you're never going to get to a situation where every country in the Eurozone can be a net exporter. As if everybody improves their competitiveness so that they can export. So much of the trade takes place between countries in the Eurozone. And everybody thinks the solution, the, the savior, right, is becoming the net exporter. It's, it's not available to everybody. And it will crush the middle class and the lower classes, as policymakers attempt to implement this, it pushes wages down, which means lower income, which means less spending, which means lower growth, which you just end up in a, in a terrible race to the bottom. Question from John, um, looking for um, an, a, another period of high inflation, another example. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the U.S. anyway, we don't, it's kind of funny that you hear people uh, resist MMT on the grounds that it will be inflationary when we've had so little experience with inflation in the U.S. Now, we've seen Latin American countries, and we're all familiar with the Weimar German case, uh, but the U.S. has experienced very low inflation, um, I mean, modest, right? It's certainly not intolerable uh, in any sense. And the high inflation that we did have in the 70s, early 80s, was largely the result of, of shocks on the supply side, which is where the inflationary problems ordinarily come from. You get an oil price shock or two, and those get passed along and, and it becomes generalized inflation as they feed into the prices of other goods and services. High interest rates under Volcker, starting in the late 70s and into the early 80s, there's a very good argument to be made, and it has been made, that raising interest rates to fight inflation Access inflation as the interest is a cost of production to firms that borrow to finance production. You raise interest rates, it raises their costs, so they raise prices to cover the rising cost of production to keep their profits from falling, and you end up, you know, chasing your tail. So um, most most of the experience with inflation for us comes on the supply side. If you look at the CPI, the consumer price index, and you say, if my goal is to keep the CPI fairly stable, what are the drivers of the CPI? And it's things like energy, healthcare, and housing. Those are the three drivers of the CPI. So if, if the goal is to limit the increases in the CPI, you have to think about what kind of policies you can have in place to prevent house price bubbles, right? To prevent rising prices in housing from driving up the CPI. Healthcare. That's a huge driver of, of inflation and, of course, energy. And so unless you're going to begin aggressively developing alternatives to um, oil and, you know, look for more sustainable alternative sources of, of energy, you're not going to do much, I think, in terms of controlling inflation as, as it's fed through that way. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Andrew here. Hi. Very interesting point. Uh, I know we've had previous discussions about uh, some of Paul Krugman's analysis in this matter as well, when he says that the greater danger is actually deflation, it's not actually inflation, and the actual why Germany seems so fixated about inflation, when in actual fact what brought on the rise of uh, Hitler and Nazism was actually the great deflation that happened in that economy at the time. So the, the argument about MMT and this constant carping about how the inflationary pressures that come with that are pretty much a lot of people would say, and of course you would, this is a non-argument, but 
people who are using it as a, a an agenda to attack the emergence of this theory, probably because they're quite worried about it, is the, the honest truth. Just a, a, an interesting point, obviously we're based in the UK and Ireland, and we've discussed some of the Eurozone issues, and we've discussed partly what's going on in America. How do you explain the economic position of the UK government, which does have a little bit more space because it's not in the Eurozone and it's not in a federal you know, state like America is, i.e. I, the constraints in, in the UK being able to have scope to make policy decisions, it's far greater for us here than it is in the Eurozone. So how do you, what is the economics from your perspective or why the UK government is pursuing the strategy of austerity that it is, because the sums just don't add up. This isn't about economics, is it? Yeah, I wish I could answer your question, Andrew, because uh, you have countries like the UK, the US, I'm reading something this morning about Japan, and they're apparently going to replicate the fiasco that we had here in the US a year or so ago when there were questions about whether we would raise the debt ceiling limit, whether the government was going to make the payments that were coming due on uh, interest payments to bondholders and payments to the elderly and disabled with you know social security and so forth. And the Japanese, uh, apparently now the politicians are playing a similar sort of game and the government is saying, well, we may not have the money to make these payments. I. I don't know to what extent there's just a fundamental lack of understanding and to what extent this becomes just a purely political game where you trump up a crisis, you, you make threats about not paying, and then you get concessions from the other side that allow you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have you know the appearance of a crisis at hand. And so you say, all right, we'll agree to raise the debt ceiling or we'll agree to make these payments, but in return we want significant cuts to public sector programs we want we want you know what i mean yep. so the uk the uk is like the us it issues the currency it it can afford literally it can afford to buy anything that is for sale in british pounds that's the limit whatever people want to sell to get pound that much the british government can afford in the us we go whatever the domestic economy and the rest of the world want to produce in order to get the us dollar that's the limit now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that government or our government should go out and buy everything that's for sale. That's not what MMT teaches. What MMT teaches is that there is no financial constraint in place. And so behaving, behaving as if affordability is the issue is simply not true. Together, because, you know, to be honest, the mainstream is still very much dominant. They're, they're in the driver's seat. And there are alternative schools of thought out there, but there's also strength in numbers. And so to the extent that we can come together and provide a more formidable um, defense against the kinds of mistakes and policy uh, errors that are coming out of the, the other side, I think we're stronger if we do it together. Having you involved in our webinar, having people like Yanis Varoufakis, which you also participated in and having Steve Keane and other individuals as part of that conversation that USI wants to help curate with individuals like yourself because the discussion that we've had thus far has been pretty illuminating and we can speak from a trade unionist perspective as an organisation that is supported by trade unions, the largest ones in the UK, that these are some of the ideas that deserve greater oxygen and that how we can through USI and other forums which you're involved in help penetrate the minds of trade union members and other progressives so we have the intellectual tools that can take on the mantra that we've been discussing today. It's absolutely essential. And we're, we're very fortunate. You mentioned Jamie Galbraith earlier and you know we have people like Jamie who has a very big reputation, who is well respected, even by many of the folks in the mainstream, but he's he's been so brave, and he's put himself out there in a way that other um, Keynesian economists, because I would call Jamie much, much more of a post-Keynesian, I mean, he's not working in the ISLM framework, he's very different from a Krugman, 
or even a Brad DeLong or some of the other names that many of your listeners may recognize, uh, Jamie is not in that macroeconomic framework where everything is an equilibrium analysis and you have uh, this idea that governments are, are constrained financially. Jamie has just eschewed all of that. And so he's really embraced a lot of the core principles of MMT. And we've worked closely with Jamie over the years. So when he writes a piece and he titles it In Defense of Deficits, it's a very powerful statement to be coming from someone like Jamie. And he's not an apologist the way so many of the others are. You know, I like to use the term... Uh, I don't know if you use this in, in the UK. I think you probably do. Do you say deficit hawks and deficit doves? Uh, it's a phrase we've borrowed from across the Atlantic that you've bestowed upon us. So, yeah, we, we, do, we do use it, absolutely. Okay, so in the US, you hear it all the time. And the deficit hawks are, you know, the folks that just believe that governments should have their hands tied behind their backs that fiscal deficits are just fundamentally irresponsible, that you should have balanced budget amendments, you should force the government to live within its means, markets will fix everything if you just leave them alone, governments will only make things worse. I mean, the, the fiscal hawks are anti-deficit spending under any circumstance. And then you have the sort of kinder, gentler bird, the deficit doves, and those are people like Paul Krugman, and Brad DeLong and, and many others. And they say, well, it's, it's true that deficits need to be brought under control. And it's true that if we don't get our fiscal house in order eventually, that we could face the kinds of problems that Greece and other countries in the Eurozone are facing. But the US can borrow at such low rates right now and unemployment is still a problem. And so let's continue to run deficits in the short term because the recovery is fragile and we don't want to jeopardize, you know, a, a double dip recession. So let's run some deficits in the short run, but get our deficits under control in the medium term. So that's your deficit dub. Yeah. And then there, there's another bird that nobody ever talks about, which is the deficit owl. And I coined the term deficit owl to try to come up with, you know, both of these are, are damaging. Both of those arguments, the doves and the hawks, both do great damage if their policies and their frameworks are followed. What want is someone who understands that you don't think about the government's budget position as a policy goal. The government's budget position should not be the target of macroeconomic policy. The target should be the real economy, the level of employment, or the rate of growth in the real economy. That's what you target, and you allow the budget to move in the way that it needs to move in order to hit a real target, like Absolutely. the level of employment. And so an owl, right, is a wise bird. An owl can see in the dark. While those <laughs> other guys are in the dark on the, the owl, like the owl knows better. So we'll go back to Jamie Galbraith, because Jamie Galbraith, again, very brave when it comes to speaking out on the deficit, because it's such uh, an unpopular thing to say, to say that deficits could actually be good, could actually be beneficial, and may not need to be brought under control even in the medium or longer term. That is so counter to everything else that you hear that it takes a, a real degree of bravery to get out there and say something like that. So Jamie has referred to himself now in writing as a deficit owl, which is, is another kind of neat thing, right? Um, and he understands that the government's budget is just one budget in the economy and that you have to consider what's happening to the government's budget in the context of what's happening to the private sector's budget balance and to the rest of the world, to the foreign balance. And so all of these things are at play. And you wouldn't simply, it wouldn't be responsible to say, by the year 2016, the government's budget needs to be 3% of GDP. How could you possibly know that, right? Unless you know what the real economy is going to look like in 2016, you have absolutely no idea how big the deficit or surplus should be in 2016. You, you just can't make a, a statement like that and, and be reasonable about it. 
Uh, Stephanie, uh, I know you're under a time constraint, um, but Raphael has just posted a long question, which might be a good one to, to finish on. Seeing as loans create deposits, if the newly created deposit is used to bid up existing resources or asset prices, a bubble develops as prices accelerate. Once the expansion of deposits is halted due to a lack of demand for new loans, prices decelerate and inevitable decline. If this train of thinking is correct, shouldn't banks be constrained in their ability to issue loans, seeing as they are not reserve constrained? Yes, banks are capital constrained, but in a boom, capital is abundant, whereas in a bust, capital is depleted. Doesn't this make the boom bigger and the bust more severe as this cycle is pro-cyclical? Has this not also led to an increase in demand for risk-free assets, including currencies that are issued by currency issuers? As a result, it seems that the global financial system is becoming increasingly fragmented due to the st distinctions in currency characteristics between issuers and users. If this is the case, how can the Eurozone crisis be solved without a full fis fiscal integration, including transfers between nations, all by nations leaving the Eurozone in order to gain monetary independence once again? <coughs> the crossroads seems clear to me, yet policymakers refuse to acknowledge this. You forgot the last line, which is, can you speak <laughs> to all of this? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Raphael. Why don't you come <laughs> right Thanks, Raphael. <laughs> I, I'm inviting Raphael to, to write a blog post for NEP. Um, yes, I think he, he's characterized things exactly correctly here. He ends with the question, if this is the case, because I'm agreeing with everything that came before this, uh, if this is the case, how can the Eurozone crisis be solved without full fiscal integration, including transfers between nation states? This is, I, I think he's hit the nail on the head here, and the answer is uh, that it really can't. It, it really can't. You have to have that, right? I mean, in the U.S., we have country, we have individual states that receive net transfers from the rest of the fiscal union, right? Nobody talks about the fact that West Virginia is always getting a fiscal transfer from the rest of the union. We don't point our finger and shame West Virginia and say, why are we seeing year after year, why can't you get your fiscal house in order, right? That's just because we're part of a union. We have um, the ability to transfer in from the federal level to states when they experience a crisis, like the disaster that happened in Mississippi and in Louisiana, right? The levees break, your towns go underwater, you have hundreds of thousands of people without any place to live, the, you know, the situation is dire. We declare a state of emergency, we transfer funds in. It's not a loan. We don't offer to lend Mississippi money to rebuild. We simply transfer uh, some U.S. dollars there to help with the rebuilding effort. And that's the kind of thing you can do when you have full fiscal union. Stephanie, if you don't mind just to come in on that, and I know we've had the, the conversation before whereby Yanis Varoufakis, for example, would take a different take in that analysis where he would say fiscal transfers aren't actually needed. What you need is actually targeted investment through institutions such as the European Central Bank. And that the issue of and the European uh, financial institutions that can invest directly in productive areas of the economy. And people like Yanis Varoufakis, and I hope I'm not doing him a disservice, would say that the... And the same as MMT, the issue of printing money is used to attack uh, the, the emergent theory about how hyperinflation can arise if you print money. That he would say the same way that fiscal transfers are being used in a damaging way as well, so that states such as Germany, you know, become allergic to the fact that they might have to give a fiscal transfer to Greece or to Spain. And his point was to say that this issue should be removed from the argument and the conversation because fiscal transfers aren't required in his analysis. Well, I, I mean, if you're not going to behave like a member of a genuine union, I, we, like I said, we don't point <coughs> our finger at West Virginia. Nobody, most Americans have no clue that West Virginia receives transfers every year from the rest of us. We just don't talk about it because we're a genuine union. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're not going to have that, then you need what I described earlier, which is instead of having this perception that one region or one nation is subsidizing the misbehavior in, in the rest of the region or in some other area, then it's got to be the ECB because the ECB takes all of that out. And what some of the MMTers, this goes back to a proposal from Warren Mosler that um, he, he proposed this years ago. And Warren said, look, 
have the ECB distribute, as I said before, on a permanent basis. This is not a temporary distribution that, uh, that you suspend once the economies have recovered. This is simply in recognition that, as I said, market economies, capitalist economies will always cycle. They'll have booms and busts. And so you need a permanent fund of some kind to help these countries stabilize spending when the inevitable downturn comes. So if the ECB makes a distribution, it goes to all 17 countries and it goes, on a per capita, it goes on a per capita basis, which means Germany gets the most. They're the biggest. So it's not a bailout. It's not a reward for bad behavior. It's a one-way transfer. It's not a loan. You accumulate the funds. You can save them for a rainy day. You can use them to develop industry. You can use it for a full employment program, whatever it is that you want to do with it. Every country gets it, every country gets it annually, and you get it on a per capita basis. Now, Warren has said things like you can still ask countries to be mindful of the fiscal deficit and the debt level, and you can set targets for those things. And you can withhold payment for countries that don't bring deficits down or achieve full employment or hit other goals that you set. And if the goals aren't being met, then you can withhold a payment in the future. But what you ought to be doing is providing that one-way transfer in recognition of the fact that the way the euro has been designed leaves countries with no viable source of finance when there's an economic downturn. Stephanie, thank you. Uh, do you have time for another question? There is, there's a question from Paolo who wants to know, why on earth does the U.S. accept LIBOR rates when Fed and Treasury could set U.S. interbank rates at will? What's the political factor here? I don't know. This is something else Warren has written about. It's a very good question, and uh, and I don't I don't know because whenever you get into the politics and we move away from the economics, I become uh, less less comfortable with the answer that I'm giving because I don't I don't think that I fully understand or maybe even um, begin to understand the politics behind some of these things. But Paul is right. Uh, there there's no reason to uh, to be accepting LIBOR, as he rightly says here. So I don't know what the politics are. I wish I could give a more meaningful answer, Paulo. Sorry. Okay. Stephanie, we've participated in this conversation for an hour. You've kindly given that time to us at USI today. On behalf of Walton and myself and USI, we really just want to thank you ever so much for spending some time with us to have a conversation about MMT and its relevance today in all areas of the world and from a trade union perspective as well. I'm sure the members of our, the, the unions who are supporting us would be fascinated about some of the things that you've had to say and we hope at USI that this is one conversation of many with you Stephanie and thank you very much. You're very welcome. Keep up the wonderful work that you're doing there. It's inspiring, really. Thanks Thank very you. much. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Hope you found that fascinating and as interesting as we did. Thanks to you all for listening, asking questions, and once again, thanks to Stephanie. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.